isn't easy. We stole the Statue of Liberty! The small one from Las Vegas. He has to control... Listen up, please! ...an army of minions. Dave? He has to outsmart... ...a ruthless archenemy. He shrinks, Ray! Oh! I hate that guy. And he's about to inherit... Hello? Three small problems. You will not cry or sneeze or barp or fart. No annoying sounds. Does this count as annoying? <sighs> Fire <it> now! <laughs> From Universal Pictures, we are going to pull off the true cry of the century. We are going to steal the moon! We shrink the moon, I grab the moon, I sit on the toilet. What? <laughs> You're funny. This summer, just because he's a bad guy, doesn't mean he's a bad guy. Three little kittens started to yawn. Now make them drink the milk. Wow, this is garbage. You actually like this? He's so fluffy, I'm gonna die. All you gotta do is knock down that spaceship there. Ah. Oh, somebody's got a frowny face. Okay, my turn. Knocked over! It's so fluffy! This big guy. This big. This big. This. This. This big about me. So we'll be getting to Despicable Me uh, in just a few minutes, but before we, we jump into that, I, I wanna share with you uh, the single Bible verse that changed the trajectory of my life. I was 20 years old, sophomore in college, really struggling in a lot of ways, uh, and I was meeting with a counselor, and this counselor shared with me Zephaniah 317. And if you don't know it, here's what it says. It says, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves, he takes great delight in you. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He rejoices over you with loud singing. Isn't that a beautiful verse and a great sentiment about who God is? And I hope for those of you that are listening to it now that this lands for you is just a, a true thing, that you just hear that and say, yeah, that's who God is and, and that's how God feels about me. I hope, hope that's what this verse speaks to you. Uh, I'll tell you that when I was 20 and I heard it, this verse hit me like a gut punch. This was the most shocking, uh, completely turning my world topsy-turvy verse I'd ever heard. Uh, and here's why, because at 20 years old, I was one of those kids that went to church every week, grew up, going to church in the Christian faith. I went to a Christian college. Uh, you know, faith was the most important thing in my life. And yet I had never heard this verse in a sermon, in a Bible study, uh, in Sunday school. Uh, I, I'd never heard this at all. This was a, a shocking truth that completely felt like 180 degrees from everything I'd internalized in 20 years of Christian faith. Because even though I'd never heard this verse, I'll, I'll tell you something I, I did hear 26 Sundays a year, uh, and not just something I heard, but something I said 26 Sundays a year, that, that our, the service we used at the time, uh, I had to say this as part of the confessional moment. I had to say, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you. And then it goes on for a while. I had to trim it for space. Uh, and then it finishes out, and so therefore, Jesus, be, be gracious and merciful to me, because who am I? A poor, sinful being. That's the truth that I proclaimed over and over again. That's what I had internalized uh, as how God felt about me. That God sees me as a, as a sinner, as a miserable being. And to then suddenly, hear a verse I'd never heard before that says, oh, actually, God delights in you. God rejoices over you. It, it didn't jibe. 
Uh, and I had, to, I had to figure this out. And, 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 and for the first time, it made me look back and say, this didn't jive. Like, honestly, if I'm being, if I'm being real with you guys, like I would say this every week, but, but I didn't actually believe this in a lot of ways. I, on the one hand, I, I sure didn't feel like a poor, miserable sinner. Uh, like, yeah, sure, I, I, I screw up sometimes, but I mean, look at the people around me. I'm, I'm doing okay. I was one of those good kids. I was a kid that was in church every week saying this. I, I was a kid that, that didn't do drugs and rob banks. Like, I, I was a good guy. And, but apparently I'm a miserable sinner and, and I believed it at one level. But, but then what it also did was it, was it created this real disconnect between me and, and who God was and what our relationship was. That, that if God sees me as a miserable sinner and, and yet God also loves me, like, okay, but, but then he loves me even though I'm worthless. He loves me even though I'm, I'm a sinful being. It, it's a loving in spite of who I am. And, and so then when, when I read in the Bible, no less, something that says, oh, no, no, God doesn't love you in spite of who you are. God delights in you. I, it, it, it completely froze my brain, guys. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, I, I have spent the 20 years since that moment wrestling with this tension. Which is it? Does God despise me as a miserable sinner or, or does God delight in me? And, and how do I know the difference or, or, or balance the tension? And, and that's what I'm hoping to share it with you today is 20 years of my own fruitfulness of what I've gleaned in, in this time of wrestling with this. Uh, and what I'll say is the Lutheran hymnal, while it maybe messed me up in this area, it also gave me help because I only actually said this on the first and third Sundays of the month. On the second and fourth Sundays, we said a different thing. We said this, the pastor would say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then we would all say as a congregation together, we'd say, but if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, a couple of things maybe stick out to you as different. One, this one's a lot friendlier uh, than the other one. Um, but the, the second thing is pretty important. This one has a thing that the other one didn't. There's this parenthetical thing at the end. See, this confessional moment is a straight quote from the Bible. That first one wasn't. That first one is something that some well-intended Christian a hundred years ago made up and wrote it down and said, this sounds good to me. And then they put it in uh, the hymnal. But, but this one, th this is straight out of the Bible, uh, which means there, there's maybe a, a glimpse into some different way uh, that, that the Bible talks about sin than, than the way we humans sometimes do. Uh, and, and so I, I actually spent some time in 1 John this week, I actually read the whole thing. So if you don't know like where this comes from, uh, 1 John is a letter that one of Jesus' closest apostles wrote to an early church, much like us today. And, uh, and this was one of Jesus' closest friends, one of the three closest to him, a guy named John. He wrote a gospel about Jesus, and he also wrote three letters. And, and this is the first of the three. And it's only five chapters long. It, it's pretty short. Uh, but you can see why they used it for a confessional moment uh, in, in a service, because First John, the letter, is all about sin. It's a, it's a letter that helps Christians wrestle with what does it mean to have sin in our lives and, and how do we handle sin and what does it like to confess sin. Uh, in five chapters, and only five chapters, John uses the word sin over 20 times. That's how much this book is about sin. But now, guess how many times John uses the word sinner? Zero. Zero times. Guess how many times uh, God, John uses the word sinful being? Zero. Even though this is a letter entirely about sin, he doesn't call us a sinner or a sinful being or miserable, any of those. Now, he does actually call us some names. You wanna know what names John calls us in his letters? I'll show you, because I listed them all. My dear children, my dear friends, dear children, dear children, children of God, beloved, Dear children, dear brothers and sisters, children, friends, beloved children. Listen, every time he, he made a, a, a label statement in, in First John, and this is it, this is every time in five chapters that he declared something about the readers and the listeners, and every time the label was nothing but positive. The label is, you are beloved, you are, you are dear children, you are friends. 
And then we got a sin problem we gotta, we gotta talk about as well. You see, the, the Bible does something really, really well that we as human beings often screw up. And in fact, I think even in one spot, our, our Lutheran hymnal screwed up. See, we conflate identity and behavior. We, we, we say those are the same thing. We say that, that, that how you behave is who you are. And, and that's the thing that humans do. It comes very naturally to us. That is not something God does. And it's certainly not something that John does in his letters when he wrote them through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. See, John knows that our identity is dear children, beloved, loved of God. That's our identity. And now our behavior, now we got some stuff we got to work on, but they are different. Notice even, look back again at that second um, section from the hymnal. Notice John, what, what, here's what he doesn't say and what I would have said. If we say we have no sin, then we're liars. That's how I would have put this. We're li- you're a liar if you say you're, if you're, if you're deceiving yourself. That's what may- you are. You are a liar. He does not say that. He doesn't label us. He doesn't, he doesn't make any claim to our identity that we have an identity of a liar, of a sinner, of a miserable being. No, he just says, hey, if, you, if, you, if you're saying you have no sin, well, you're deceiving yourself, buddy. Don't, don't kid yourself. <laughs> the truth is not in you in this moment. You're still a beloved child of God, John says. And, and, and so to, to start off our, our topic for today, to just, if I can just make one thing really, really clear. You and I are not miserable sinners. We're not. That's not scriptural. Maybe, maybe I was a miserable sinner for about 10 days of my life. But, but on day 10 after I was born, I was baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And a lot of you were too. And whatever might have gone on in those first 10 days, and and that's up for some discussion, from day 10 until 43 years old, I have never been anything but a beloved child of God, and neither have you. Neither have you. And and yet, I wish it were that simple. I I wish I could declare that and and we'd get it. Uh, But the fact is, we all of us struggle, and we've struggled for 2,000 years with this tension. It's so hard to keep these things distinct. Am I a beloved child? Am I a miserable sinner? And and, and on the one hand, I wanna believe this, but then why do I still sin? And and if I am a miserable sinner, then why would God love me in the first place? And and we we struggle with this tension and we always will. And and I hope to at least shed a little bit of light with it to you today because we do need to wrestle with this. And like I said already, I'll, I'll say it one more time. I promise you that my identity and yours, I promise you is that we are a beloved child period. But I don't want to be shallow and superficial and act like that means uh, our our sin lives get less complicated. And and so there's some wrestling that we have to do, every one of us, like, okay, so then what what percentage of me is a beloved child, you know, and and what percentage of me is is, is sin, or or maybe it's my behaviors, maybe some of my behaviors God likes, and then they're good childlike behaviors, and other behaviors are sinful behaviors. What's the ratio? of beloved child to miserable sinner? Am I like 80% beloved and 20% sinful? What percentage of me does God delight in? And what percentage of me does he despise? I think it's an important question and it's certainly one that's, that's plagued me for most of my life. And it's the question I want us to really wrestle with today because we don't use these terms anymore, but, but the fact is what part of me is delightful to God? What part of me is despicable to God. And now suddenly you maybe start to see why this movie might make sense to look at today. So we're going we're gonna to look at Despicable Me, and, and I'll just tell you up front, I'm treating this movie the way I treat the parables of Jesus. You know, so Jesus told parables. These were, these were interesting stories that revealed a deeper spiritual truth. And, and so I, I, I think Despicable Me in a lot of ways is a parable that reveals some deeper spiritual truths. Uh, And so just like Jesus would do sometimes when he'd tell a parable, he'd give the listeners a cheat sheet to help them understand the point he was trying to make. He'd say, look, in this parable, there's there's gonna be a God figure and then there's gonna be someone that represents you human beings and and he'd tell them who it was. And and so in the same way, I think that in Despicable Me, there is a God figure and then there is a a figure who represents our human condition. Uh, And believe it or not, the God figure in Despicable Me is Agnes. If you don't know the story, there are three sisters, orphaned girls, and Agnes is the youngest sister. 
Uh, and I think in some very real and important ways, she represents how God interacts and feels about us uh, in the world. And, and so if God is Agnes, through process of elimination, you can maybe guess who, who represents us in, in this movie. Yeah, it's Gru. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the villain. Uh, so, so let's look at these two, what, what we see about them and how they act towards each other uh, and what we can learn about that for ourselves as we try to wrestle with which parts of us are a delightful me and which parts are a despicable me. Uh, and so in this first clip, we're just gonna meet Gru. We're gonna get a real uh, character study in who he is, what motivates him, uh, the way that he tends to move through life. So let's check out this introduction to Gru. What a jerk, right? Uh, what, what I love about him, it's not just that he's mean, it's that he goes out of his way to be mean. Like he could have just laughed at the kid, but instead he had to make the pain and misery worse. Uh, and, and then the, the, the final touch for me that I love to someone who, who's been a server, uh, you know, and been in retail, uh, you know, that the, if you don't want to tip your server, tip your barista, that's your choice, that's the thing. To tip them a quarter, oh, like that's, that's him like really rubbing it in. Uh, that's how, that's what a miserable sinner Gru is, right? So, so, so this is the picture. They, they, they've introduced this guy. He is a villain. He is despicable. Uh, and you might have caught it from the trailer, but just to, to recap, his, his dastardly plan is he wants to steal the moon. He's going to build a rocket, fly the rocket to the moon, shrink the moon with a shrink ray, grab it, bring it down, and then somehow profit. I'm not I'm never quite clear on, on what he, I think he's going to hold the moon for ransom. He never really says how this is going to make him any money, but, but this is the plot, okay? And, and at some point through, through obstacles he's trying to overcome, he decides that he needs these three orphan sisters to help him with a particular part of his plan. Uh, and so he's going to trick them uh, by adopting them, pretending to adopt them, uh, use them uh, for his plan, and then ditch them at the first opportunity. A pretty despicable thing to do, right? Right? Here's how that scene goes. Please tell Margot, Edith, and Agnes to come to the lobby. I bet the mom is beautiful. I bet the daddy's eyes sparkle. I bet their house is made of gummy bears. I'm just saying it. Be nice. Aw, oh, my caterpillar never turned into a butterfly. That's a cheetah. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, Debbie was a very lucky woman. Who's Debbie? Your wife. Oh, hi, girls. <laughs> girls, I want you to meet Mr. Gru. He's going to adopt you. And he's a dentist <laughs> uh, hi I'm Margot this is Edith and that's Agnes I got your leg I got your leg okay there's enough little girl let go of my leg come on Hiya. really good just Hiya. release a grip wow <laughs> how do you move them is there a command some nonstick spray? Crowbar? Uh, 
Okay, girls, let's go. I mean, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Their, their ideal hopes for what their adopted parents would be like, and then they get grew. And the two older sisters, that they have the reaction you would expect, shock, uh, disappointment. Uh, I, I love that when he picked a fake profession, he, he was trying, he, he could not have picked a profession more disappointing to a child than dentist. <laughs> but did you notice how Agnes reacted to him? No disappointment, no, no shattered dreams. She just ran to him giggling grabbed his leg and showed him nothing but unconditional love and delight. She delighted in him, dentist and all. And that's crazy. And, and I think it's easy for us when we watch this movie to write this off as the naive actions of a silly little child who's not old enough to know better. But, but maybe there's something else going on there. Because what you see is that throughout the rest of the movie, every weird thing about him, Agnes loves. He has a dog. It's not even a dog. It's like an abomination with legs. She loves it. He has a house full of spiky things and weapons. She loves it. He, he puts them to bed in diffused torpedoes. At least he hopes they're diffused. She loves it. Every weird thing about him, everything that would normally be a reason why the world would judge him, or why people would think he, he's, he's gross or evil or malevolent, she just receives it with the pure simplicity and joy of a child, and she just delights in who Gru is. And, and that culminates in, in, this, in this climactic moment where, where Gru finds out that his evil plan is about to fail, that the, the money he needs to build the rocket to get to the moon so that he can steal it, he doesn't have. And so then notice what Agnes does in this moment where his evil plan is on the brink of failure. <sighs> now, I know there have been some rumors going around that the bank is no longer funding us. Well, I am here to put those rumors to rest. They are true. In terms of money, we have no money. So how will we get to the moon? The answer is clear. We won't. We are doomed. Now would probably be a good time to look for other employment options. I know I have fired up my resume as I suggested all of you do as well. What is it? Can't you see that I'm in the middle of a pep talk? This is a shocking and transgressive moment. And I think we miss it sometimes because we just write Agnes off as a, as a cute little girl that doesn't know what she's doing. But, but there is something that is so unheard of that happens in this scene. And here's what it is. We love and we're very used to movies and stories where the bad guy gets redeemed, where, where he turns his back on the evil path and he chooses the light uh, and he helps the heroes. We love those stories, but they always go in a particular order. The, the, the bad guy, the villain, he has to repent first. He has to turn from his wicked ways first. Darth Vader has to, instead of killing Luke, turn on the emperor and kill him. And then they're welcomed to the light side with, with open arms. We love a villain redemption story, but that's not what happens in Despicable Me. He hasn't repented of his evil ways. He is still intending to steal the moon. And what Agnes, in her role as the God figure, she is supporting and endorsing his evil plan. 
And that's the shocking part. Because here's the thing, I think that's exactly what God does to you and me in real life. See, I think we have built this narrative as humans that, that once we repent, once we turn from our wicked ways, once we stop being a miserable sinner, then God will delight in us. And that is not what scripture teaches. It's not what despicable me shows. She fully delighted in, in this evil thing. She, she, it wasn't like she saw past his gruff exterior uh, to the heart of gold inside. She, she willingly endorsed and agreed with his evil plan to, to steal the moon. And that's what Agnes delighted in, so much so that she was willing to give all the money she had in her piggy bank to make it happen. That's weird. Uh, it's weird, but I think it is so important for us now. See, as I've been wrestling with Zephaniah 3 for 20 years, uh, two pieces of wisdom have, I've picked up along the way have, have finally helped me make some peace with how these things could all be true, that the tensions that we're wrestling with. And the first uh, is from a guy named Shola Richards, a Christian leader. Uh, he, he said this, he says, all bad behavior is an unskilled expression of an unmet need. I wanna say that again. All bad behavior is nothing more than an unskilled expression of an unmet need. Now, I think this has huge theological implications, but I'll also tell you this has huge parenting implications. Uh, I heard this first three years ago and my parenting is completely transformed since I heard this. Because before this, my, my, my parenting was largely behavior-based. I, I, I was frustrated when my kids would, would sin, when they do bad things. Uh, and I would try to change the behavior. Right? So there'd be consequences, and we'd talk about you know, you know, the fun, punishment fitting the crime, and all this stuff. And, and when I heard this from Shola, it, it helped me reframe my, my own children. That maybe when they're being rude or disrespectful, or they're fighting with their siblings, or they're, or, or they're, or they're um, you know, being selfish. Maybe it's not as much about the bad behavior and I need to write them off and just, just deal with that. Maybe there's an unmet need going on underneath it. And in fact, I, that's what I've seen over and over again. That the more I've tried to put this in practice to have this be my filter with my children, it's totally right. Like my, my, one of my kids will say something really rude to one of the other kids, like really hurtful. And, and, and instead of just cracking down on, we use kind words in this family. I, I ask, you know, hey, what, what, what were you going for there? And, and, and often it's, they were just trying to make their siblings laugh. They wanna be funny. They, they wanna feel like they've got something to contribute. Uh, there's generally an unmet need and when I recognize the bad behavior is, is less a thing for me to, to crack down on and more a thing for me to use as a, as a litmus test that my child is having something unmet, it's, it's been amazing that the better job I do of it, the more the bad behaviors melt away. They just, they just kind of go away. That, that, that when, if, if they're feeling disconnected and so they act out because at least it makes me notice them, well, maybe I can offer them connection instead and, and then the acting out doesn't need to happen as much. So, so that was the first piece. And, and again, for parenting at least, consider it because it, it's been super helpful to me. But, but then the second piece that connected with this was what I needed. This is from Larry Crabb uh, in his book, Spiritual Community. He, he says that he, he's, a, he's a psychotherapist for 30 plus years. And, and he says in all of his time working with people, what he's finally discovered is that every felt desire is at root a longing for God. Although often unrecognized as such by us human beings. And now this is really transgressive because I don't know about you, but, but, but I grew up hearing that, that, that deep down inside at our core, we are sinful, selfish, proud beings. Why did Adam and Eve sin in the garden? Well, because they were too proud. You know, they, they, wanted, they wanted to do it their way. You know, why, why is there problems in the world? You know, why, why is the world a messy, broken place? Because everyone's selfish. Deep down at their core, you're selfish. And that's why we have all these problems. And Larry Crabb is saying, actually, from a biblical lens, from a Christian lens, I don't think that's right. He, he said, I think at the deep core of our being is not pride, is not selfishness, it is a longing for God that has gone unmet. A longing for God that, that we then twist to our ends. And, and he does not deny sin and neither do I. Flyer Crab says, no, sin happens, sin is real, but recognize sin for what it is. It's our unskilled attempt to meet an unmet need. And it's ultimately this pure longing for God. 
Larry Crabb says every criminal, every addict, uh, every person he's ever worked with, that even the very thing underlying the, the sinful, twisted behavior, it was at its core a desire and a longing for connection with God. And yet they turned away or they, they, they got it in, in, a, in a wrong way. And now suddenly you can reframe the Garden of Eden. Well, now that's not Adam and Eve wanting pride, you know, doing something out of pride. It's that they, they wanted deep connection with God and, and they chose to go about it by disobeying what he told them to do. You, you, can, you can reframe all these things. And, and, and these are the things that changed life for me because what it does is, is if these are true, and I, I really believe they are, then when God looks at me, he's not distracted by my bad behavior and my unskilled expressions. He, he's not fooled by my twisted, sinful ways to try to, to fill my longing for him. God sees the pure longing heart that he put in me and he delights in it. That's how God can delight in me from the beginning. He delights in me before I change anything about my life because he knows how he built me originally. And he sees and he is grieved by how sin has twisted up my life and, and made me settle for less. But he's also confident that he can, through the power of the resurrection and his Holy Spirit, make something better out of my life. And that's why God can delight in me every step of the way and also delight in even the things that other people would call despicable. That's what I think Agnes does. See, if you watch Despicable Me, you find out that Gru had a mother who was very alienating, indifferent. Maybe she didn't even love him. Certainly she never expressed any delight in him. Even when he's doing things like building rockets as an eight-year-old, she had no words of delight or encouragement for Gru. And so what's this unmet need? He just wants someone to delight in him. And so what's his unskilled expression of it? Well, he figures if he can keep doing bigger and bigger criminal heists, someone will notice and someone will tell him good job. And, and specifically, he sure would love for it to be his mom. And, and so what is it that Agnes in her role as the God figure offers him? She sees beneath the behaviors. She sees the heart, the desire for someone to delight in him. And so she just does. She just delights in him. Not, not the thing that, he, that, that maybe he's going to be someday or when you, when you clean up your act, or she just delights in him. And she says, you want to go to the moon? Let's go to the moon. And she supports his dream, misguided as it might be. And, and, and that's the picture that's finally helped me make sense uh, of how it can be that, that I'm a beloved child, but, but, but there's also sin in me. How do I live in this? Uh, and and I, I think Despicable Me does a really great job of, of showing that tension uh, in a way that is consistent with scripture. But, but I also get that it's a little weird to say that, that uh, you know, God delights in an evil villain and that's why God delights in us. Uh, we, I don't know if you and I can relate to that. I, I've never tried to steal the moon. You probably haven't either. Uh, so I actually wanna close out today with a, with a bonus movie, uh, one we didn't warn you about, but, but a movie that I think more accurately would, will land for us in just the regular ordinary lives we're trying to lead and, and what it means for us to have God delight even in our worst or incomplete moments. And, and so this movie is called Begin Again. Uh, and you don't really need to know a lot about the premise. All you need to know is that Kira Knightley is a young, aspiring singer-songwriter uh, and she's about to give up because she's a failure. Nobody likes any of her songs. Uh, and that's, that's the premise. And, and also I'll help you out one other way, uh, just like I did before, the God figure uh, in this movie and in this scene is Mark Ruffalo. So look for him uh, and enjoy this clip. Thanks very much. Um, I know that there's a lot of people uh, on the list to play tonight, but I was wondering if I could just add one more. She's a... Uh, a friend a long way from home. And if it's okay with you, I was wondering if you'd like her to come up here and play one of her songs. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah? yeah. Greta, would you come up here, please? Yeah. Uh, just give me a boom. Greta, come on, this is New York. <laughs> you want to hear it, right? Yeah? 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 gonna be amazing. Um, hi. Uh, so, 
This is a new song, so it might be kind of rough. Um, it's for anyone who's ever been alone in the city. <laughs> So you find yourself at the subway With your world in a bag by your side And all at once it seemed like a good way You realize it's the end of the line Now, maybe you liked your song, maybe you didn't, uh, but the thing to notice is no one in the bar was impressed. They, they very quickly turned back to their conversations and their drinks. They didn't even notice when she finished, her, her, her buddy had to be like, yay, yay, had to, had to kick off the applause. That's how unimpressed people were with her song. But you also saw at the end, there was one person standing there looking at her a little differently than the rest of the bar was. Uh, and in the movie, they, uh, a little bit later on, they, they circle back around and they show this scene again. But this time, they show it from Mark Ruffalo's perspective. So, this is a new song, so it might be kind of rough. It's for anyone who's ever been alone in the city. <laughs> So you find yourself at the subway With your world in a bag by your side And all at once it seemed like a good way You realize it's the end of the line For what it's worth Are you ready for the last act 
every one of us, you and I, are writing a story out of our life, trying to make a symphony out of our choices. And the world looks at us and sees only where we fall short, sees how we're imperfect, how it's not what it should be, and it despises us for it. But God sees the story that he wants to write with your life. He sees the symphony that he could make. And God delights not only in who he originally created you to be, but in who he's going to help you become in the future. That's why God can delight in us in spite of our failures, our limitations, our mistakes, and our sins. And it's not just my opinion, that's what John himself says in this very letter we've been talking about. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. And the reason the world doesn't recognize us for what we are is that it did not recognize him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, but what we will become has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. John is describing for you and I the thing that we have a promise of that we have already been named and delighted in by our heavenly father, God. And we don't get to see it now, but he already sees this beautiful thing that we will become, that he will create in and through our lives and our stories. And so this is the silver screen truth I wanna leave you with. That if you've needed to hear it, then hear it now. God delights in you far more than you realize. And the way he's able to do that is because he recognizes that, that those pure, holy desires that, that are beneath the surface of our sinful behaviors. And God's already looking ahead and he knows the glorious future you that you are becoming. And this you can count on every step, every day of your life. This will always be true of you. So let's pray and give thanks to God. Lord God, you're the one who made us. You see our hearts so deeply. And you also grieve and see how we have fallen short of the story or the symphony you would write with us, but none of it deters you. None of it makes you look at us with disgust you still only see us through the delight of a father who loves his children. And you will not let the sin and brokenness of this world derail who you are making us become as your children. Your good goals for us, your picture for who we could be, it's never too late and you will not fail in your efforts. And so, Lord, I pray that here and now, every person listening would leave any sh shame, guilt, condemnation behind. They'd throw it away because a child of God deserves their Heavenly Father's delight. And Lord, help us with eagerness and trust to embrace the beautiful thing that you, that you can do and that you are doing even here and now in every step of our journey. We pray this trusting in the power of Jesus. I love name. a good story, Amen. don't you? I hope you found the truth of the gospel today in the scenes of our featured film. Thanks for joining us at Pathfinder Church, where we're bringing together imperfect people in pursuit of a whole life. If you want to learn more about us, head over to pathfinderstl.org. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter or for even more content. Speaking of content, check out Pathfinder Message Podcast to go back and listen to all of our messages. You can also follow Pathfinder Music on Spotify to hear songs that we'll be playing next weekend. If you'd like to support our ministry with a gift, visit pathfinderstl.org forward slash gift. It's your generosity that fuels our work here at Pathfinder Church. Well, have a blessed week, and we'll see you next time.